Hello and welcome to our conference session. This is War From Below. Uh, my name is Caitlin Smith, although some of you may know me online as my dearest Angelica, and I'll be chairing this session. Um, war From Below looks at how war is experienced and recorded by non-combatants who may or may not have strong allegiances to a, a combat side. And this panel specifically focuses on previously understudied accounts of war, especially private writing by women. It's my great pleasure then to introduce the first of our three speakers today. Dr. Patrick O'Brien is a limited term assistant professor of history at Kennesaw State University. He'll be presenting his paper, Gilded Misery, Reconsidering Emotions and Community During the American Revolution. Dr. O'Brien, you have the floor. In January, 1784, a small group of mourners met in Halifax, Nova Scotia's old burying ground to pay their respects to Jeremiah Drummers Rogers. The deceased, like the majority of those assembled, was not originally from Nova Scotia. Instead, he was a refugee who had fled Massachusetts during the earliest days of the revolution in 1775. Although Rogers imagined his exile in Halifax would be short-lived, in the year before his passing, he had watched the seemingly endless deluge of refugees pour into the city as the defeated British evacuated the last of their strongholds in the now independent United States. Rogers never returned to his native home. Like many other loyalists, he fell victim to the diseases that spread through Halifax as thousands of refugees overcrowded the city. Among the mourners were two other New England refugees, the Reverend Mathers Biles Jr., who served as the Anglican chaplain to the garrison in Halifax and assistant to the rectors of St. Paul's Anglican Church, and Mary Roby, the 19-year-old daughter of a prosperous hardware merchant. Importantly, both Rogers and Roby described the funeral in their personal writings. In a letter back to relatives in Massachusetts, Biles noted that he attended the funeral among many other activities that week, writing simply, I attended the funeral of a son of the Reverend Mr. Rogers of Littleton, who has left a widow and eight children. In contrast, Roby's diary entry provides a more descriptive account of the affair and how she felt about it. Mr. Rogers is dead, she began, such is the lot of all mankind. Be still my heart and cease to flow my tears. Yet not the bare knowledge of his death could affect me like viewing the indescribable distress of his wife. How hard is her lot? Her feelings did not dissipate upon returning home. Instead, she continued to think about the grave scene. I am still reflecting on the dissolution of Mr. Rogers' image before me, she wrote. I cannot attend to visitors or anything else. Everything seems trifling. I open with this vivid juxtaposition between Biles' seeming indifference and Roby's apparent distress in order to emphasize the two driving arguments of my paper. First, for the loyalist refugees in Nova Scotia, suffering, like the kind Roby described and Biles skirted, was ubiquitous and perhaps the defining aspect of revolutionary British loyalism. In total, somewhere between 60,000 and 100,000 loyalists fled the American states during and after the revolution. And unless you live in the Canadian Maritimes, where more than 30,000 of, 30, of these loyalists landed, or in Ontario, chances are you know little about who these refugees were. Over the past two decades, interest in the subaltern has increased attention to the men and women who found themselves on the wrong side of revolution. The result has been a growing awareness of the social, economic, political, and even racial diversity of the loyalist refugees. More recently, historians have begun to askew the narrow political definitions of loyalism and have instead dug deep into exposing the varieties, degrees, shades, and even differences between British loyalists during the late 18th century, especially pertaining to loyalist women and loyalists of African descent. But despite this scholarship, little attention has been paid to the emotional frameworks that have buttressed British loyalism. And here, I would like to argue that shared grief was at the heart of the loyalist experience. This brings me to my second point, and one that I believe is critical to understand at a time of worldwide dramatic hardship. Although periods of upheaval can exacerbate suffering and create intense feelings of isolation, collective grief can also be a powerful unifying force and one that is most commonly curated by the dispossessed. Behind the stark contrast between Biles seeming indifference and Rogers, to Rogers' death and Roby's intense feelings of loss is an inherently gendered understanding of the loyalist community of which all three were a part. For a ranking member of British society, Biles believed that the Loyalist community should be inherently unwavering, and although the Loyalists had their gripes with the British government, steadfastness, or the stiff upper lip, was a defining characteristic of what it meant to be British. But as a young woman, Roby had a more personal connection with the refugee community, because she and other women of town frequently visited newly arrived strangers and served as important pillars of support for those without other connections. 
Therefore, I also argue that wives and daughters were barred from the political discourse of grievance that defined the loyalist public sphere, but in places where suffering abounded, women like Roby created the intense emotional framework of suffering and sympathy, which rebuilt the social connections lost during the loyalist experience. When we look at loyalist hardship, it's important to both recognize the difference between physical and emotional suffering and understand the hardship was inescapable, even for those sca uh, spared the worst of the poverty. Historians have long recognized the unpreparedness that created a humanitarian disaster as the influx of tens of thousands of refugees shortly after the conclusion of the revolution inundated government officials across the empire. In September 1784, one official in Halifax wrote to London explaining that he was forced to house refugees in the military barracks to prevent them from, quote, perishing in the streets. On the other side of the colony, the Reverend Jacob Bailey wrote, several hundred refugees are stored in our church and larger numbers are still unprovided for. He continued, near 400 refugees of these miserable exiles have perished in a violent storm. And he worried that disease, disappointment, poverty, and chagrin would finish off uh, more than another hundred before the return of spring. But Bailey's comments on poverty and exposure also point to a less tangible, but at least in his opinion, equally deadly aspect of loyalist experience, emotional suffering. Here again, the betrayal of the loyalists felt at the hands of their own government is well documented. Jonathan Sewell, the last colonial general attorney of Massachusetts before the war, explained that despite his allegiance, he could not find one former friend in parliament who would now give him the lowly position of, quote, dog whipper anywhere in the empire. Before departing New York City for Nova Scotia, Sarah Winslow rebuked the empire for abandoning her faithful subjects, leaving them to, quote, mourn out our days in wretchedness. No doubt the loyalists were angry. They felt unduly persecuted by former friends, neighbors, and relatives, and betrayed by their own government. But as the Loyalists settled into their new homes, they quickly had to cope not only with anger, but with nostalgia. The Loyalists are often referred to as colonists, and they did in fact accel uh, accelerate the process of settler colonialism that systematically dispossessed indigenous people of their land in places like Nova Scotia. But it is important to note that the Loyalists were also exiles and carried emotional baggage of being forced from their homes and separated from their friends and family. For those who landed in Nova Scotia, the landscape and climate appeared foreign, unwelcoming, and even detrimental to their personal character. One refugee wrote back to the States explaining, quote, all our golden promises have vanished. We were taught to believe this place was not barren and foggy as been represented, but we find it 10 times worse. It is the most inhospitable climate that ever a mortal set foot on. Only a few months after arriving in Halifax, Mary Roby's mother wrote that she believed the, quote, dark and rainy Halifax weather had caused her to lose her, quote, New England head. This feeling of removal and dislocation is what made funerals loyalists attended so unnerving. Death and exile represented the ultimate defeat. Burial and exile was an enduring anguish. Critically then, even though spared the worst of the physical suffering could not escape the inexorable emotional toll of exile. Of the widespread suffering, Roby noted in her diary, quote, I've been a great deal engaged in some painful and melancholy scenes which have almost effaced the more pleasing ones. If I look round me, what thousands I may see more wretched than myself. Even while attending a festive holiday ball at the governor's mansion, she could not escape the despair. I never draw, dare to draw back the curtain to look at what is behind all this apparent happiness, she explained, lest I should find sometimes only gilded misery. Importantly, however, the rampant and inescapable sadness of loyalist exile was not entirely defeating. To the contrary, shared suffering, curated and maintained by wives and daughters, proved a powerful unifying force. While scholars have long explained that the Loyalist settlements never lived up to becoming the envy of the American states, amid the hardship, refugee women became important figures of community building. Focusing solely on the male-dominated political arena, historians have long depicted a tumultuously divided Loyalist community. However, examining how women used the gilded misery of exile to form bonds among refugees from all regions of the American colonies, the community looks more coherent. For example, in October 1783, Mary Roby noted in her diary the busy day she, her sister, and her mother had visiting newly arrived refugees. They were people of character, she recorded, and Mama visited them as they knew nobody here. Having visited newly arrived families, the Roby women also learned about their needs. In one family, a young woman had died, and her parents worried she'd be buried without mourners. The Roby sisters agreed to attend the stranger's funeral in order that she not be, as Mary wrote it, noted in her diary, buried, quote, in a strange place, unknown and unlamented. 
Although Roby explained that she originally felt uncomfortable attending the stranger's funeral, she later noticed that both she and her sister felt, quote, obliged to be in all service of our power to those here. This service was not only important in building community, but also in providing loyalist wives and daughters the vital practicing public sensibility. As Nicole Eustace notes in her work on emotions in the late 18th century, sensibility meant the readiness to feel compassion for suffering and to be moved by the pathetic, which ironically emphasized the receptivity of emotions of others as a primary intent of cultivating the elevation of self. Although women were entirely excluded from the loyalist public sphere, they found important community roles amid the inescapable sadness of exile that also helped demonstrate their individual character. To conclude, I think that more fully understanding how the loyalists responded to the turmoil of revolution and exile has many lessons for modern people experiencing business as unusual. But for the sake of time, I believe it is critical to note that during moments of paradigm shift, collective emotions carry tremendous power and traditionally marginalized people stand in a unique position to be the curators of these movements. I don't want to paint an overly rosy picture. After all, the astute listener will notice I didn't talk about the black loyalists in the community of suffering. And this is because white loyalists of all ranks did their best to differentiate between their own suffering as somehow more valid than that of their black counterparts. However, it seems to me that at this moment, one characterized by collective unease and very real grief, this may be the perfect opportunity to unite a diverse group of people who share little else than their collective unhappiness with the norm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Brien. Um, up next, we'll be hearing from Dr. Hedia Uskin, who is Assistant Professor of English at Aksaray University. She'll be presenting her paper, The Rupture Between the South and North, The Diary of Nancy Emerson and War Discourse. Dr. Uskin, you have the floor. Nancy Emerson, a 56-year-old middle-class woman living in Augusta County, Virginia, began writing a journal in May 1862 and continued until November 1864 to record the American Civil War from a Southern woman's perspective. Participating in the debate and contributing to the perception of war in her journal allowed Emerson to problematize the boundaries between the South, North, freedom, enslavement, public-private, subject, object, and masculine feminine. Emerson conveys a dramatic socio-political rupture in American history by resisting rhetorically, physically, and politically to the freedom of enslaved African Americans and efforts of Northern abolitionists who, according to her, go against God's will. I argue that Emerson's personal narrative problematized the voice and place of women along with the institutional slavery within war discourse. On one hand, Emerson demolishes and crosses the borders set against women, yet on the other, she supports the idea of preserving racial boundaries, reinforcing through slavery. I will discuss how Emerson justifies the preservation of slavery, drawing a parallel between religion and property of slavery, yet she challenges traditional gender norms of the 19th century society through the act of writing. The American Civil War was a turning point in history when slavery was considered as an integral part of the socioeconomic life in the South. One of the causes of the Civil War was that the North banned slavery while the South heavily relied on enslaved African American labor in cotton plantations. There were economic differences between these two states. Uh, the South depended on agriculture and farming while the North um, was industrial. So there was a conflict about state rights too. For the North federal government, our stream throughout the nation, the South believed that the importance of state, state rights. Another cause of the war was the elections of 1860 when Abraham Lincoln won the elections in the North as the 16th US president and 11 Southern states seceded from the Union as a result of Lincoln's win. They are referred as the Confederate States or Confederacy, while loyal states are known as Union. So when the war transformed the social, cultural, and economic world of the Southern women, they uh, sought to invent new foundation of self-definition and self-worth as the props of whiteness, wealth, gentility, and dependence threatened to disappear. Harsh conditions of the war and conflict pushed women towards the politicized arena where they desired to redefine themselves and their ideologies within the turmoil. Seeking a place in this national crisis, most Southern women, including, including Emerson, believed that they could contribute to the war effort by using words. So the verbal communication was to keep the spirit of the South alive. 
as an everyday context of women, personal narratives became a fertile space where they could grow and spread their confident ideology since they had very, since they had very limited opportunities to deliver speeches in front of large audiences. I want to explain what ideology means. So ideology is a set of belief and philosophies, especially one on which political system or organization or a party is based. Confederate Vice President Alexander H. Stephens explained Confederate ideology in his speech, known the cornerstone speech given in 1861 in Savannah. He argues that Confederate ideology depends, quote, upon the truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior, superior race, is his natural and normal condition, end of quote. Stephen's ideas were shared by Southern women, including Emerson, who transformed the domestic space into public by publicizing her, their private life in journals, memoirs, and diaries. So literary modes include intense emotional responses and reveal the psychological state of individuals rather than the physical effort in a battlefield. So comforted women's feminine delivery choices are considered non-threatening and quote, contrasted with masculine style, end of quote, which is addressing to the audience on the stage and in public places. This feminine form is a challenge against the old masculine form by establishing a new discourse. Uh, one of the ways in which Southern women construct a collective political identity and share confident responsibility is the prayers depicted in uh, their journals that juxtapose Southern patriotism and religion as a common rhetorical stance. So many secess secessionist women, including Emerson, saw their prayers as public rhetorical efforts that connected them with the fellow Southerners and provided them an active role in the war effort. Emerson participated in a collective activity as a formation of self, uh, female self-consciousness to explore the meaning of womanhood and cell, uh, sisterhood. Prayer meetings open uh, avenues for Emerson and supporter of Confederacy to identify themselves within a larger group of women under solidarity spectrum where they can exchange spiritual wires against the Yankees. Emerson articulates the idea that God is with Southern people to protect them from the invasion and cruelties of the North. In her prayers, Emerson calls not Northern people as ungodly nations since according to her, they refuse to practice the orders of God about slavery. So demonizing the North and hoping for its fall reflect Emerson's perception based on her biblical, biblical justification of slavery, which carries her verbal resistance to a theological domain. As Harrison mentions, quote, Southerners saw themselves more religious than their opponents, end of quote, and Emerson had this assumption accusing the North and believed that God would not turn his back on a pious nation. Uh, besides prayers, a religious discourse is used by Emerson to cope with the painful and disturbing idea of death by rationalizing it in terms of Southern patriotism. Philip Proudhon mentions that in the war, religion served not only justify the killing, but also to provide comfort that 620,000 deaths required. Emerson's calm acceptance of death blends the theme of personal and national salvation. For Emerson, serving the army means serving the Lord. She emphasized the idea that the loss of loved ones, like military defeats, must be accepted as a part of God's plan, even celebrated as the advent of immortality. This belief draws our attention to the justification and consolidation in religion. Emerson rejects the defeat, suggesting that Confederate soldiers will lose their lives However, they will be honored with grace, meaning victory. Emerson includes news and stories in her narrative as a verbal resistance and form of interaction with larger community, blending the cultural and political discourse circulated among the society with her personal narrative. She attributes her discourse and archival function in relation to the historical context. Uh, one of the newspapers she includes in her narrative was Wake, which is Richmond Daily Wake, a local newspaper brought by soldiers and shared with community during, during meetings in the church. The news published in the Wake takes another shape in Emerson's journal, as I mentioned. So Emerson unshakably 
commitment to the Confederate cause is conveyed clearly in an entry where she quotes the story about an old Negro who was kept by federal officers on nothing but water for three days because he refused to work and said he was secesh. Uh, quote, noble fellow, it does one good to hear such instances. End of quote. Emerson affirms that even black slaves were loyal to the Confederate cause. As a life narrator who chronicled wartime, illuminate a certain period of time and enshrine a community, Emerson created history in a sense, justifying her own perceptions, conveying cultural information and inventing desirable features. She problematized her position as a Southern woman by justifying one institution, slavery, while challenging another one, patriarchy, as the only source of her consciousness and Nancy Emerson's journal is a reflection of this conflict, which needs more scholarly attention in order to explain the dynamic between Confederacy, patriarchy, and being a single woman, white woman in the South during the Civil War. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Oskin. Our next speaker is Edwin Tran. Edwin Tran is a political analyst for the International Review, Encyclopedia Geopolitica, and Caspian Report. He will be presenting his paper, Crossing Sect and Race, Civilian Ingenuity During the Lebanese Civil War. Go ahead, Mr. Tran. From 1975 to 1990, Lebanon was a battlefield of ideologies, sectarian identities, socioeconomic classes, and geopolitical proxies. Many discussions of the Civil War often emphasize these points, highlighting dramatic events like the emergence of Hezbollah and the assassination of Bashir Gemayel. Such narratives place an emphasis on the various militias and international superpowers involved, and while these assessments are useful in the spheres of international relations and geopolitics, they've often sidelined the narratives of those most affected by the ruins of conflict. Those in this period are often described as lacking agency and at the mercy of the various uh, militias, a narrative that is clearly false. In fact, civilians during the Lebanese Civil War were far from being passive actors and instead demonstrated ingenuity and proactiveness, engaging in everything from civil society projects to social service deliverances. To better understand this development, it's first important to address the historical context of the war. Since the country's independence from France in 1943, the socio-political system of Lebanon was defined by the National Pact. This agreement allotted a set number of parliamentary seats and political positions to sectarian identities. For instance, a Maronite would always control the presidency while the prime minister would always be a Sunni Muslim. Major political families emerged while many groups in Lebanon were marginalized by the state. Shiite Muslims in South Lebanon, for instance, lacked political representation and were relegated to agricultural labor in the service of landlords. Much of Lebanon saw a political economy defined by rentierism, clientelism, and inequality. And these divides were exacerbated by the influx of Palestinian refugees that entered the country following the 1948 and 1967 Arab-Israeli wars. Despite some efforts at reform by leaders like Fuad Sheheb, these divides were constant factors up until the emergence of the civil war. Tensions between Palestine and Maronite factions eventually boiled over on April 13, 1975. Battles erupted in Beirut. This was followed by conflict across the country with further battles in the Beka Valley and in the Shouf Mountains utterly devastating those regions, displacing thousands of civilians. However, within the shifting alliances and dramatic battles of the Lebanese Civil War were cases of broken homes, destroyed infrastructure, and dampening socioeconomic conditions that only worsened throughout the war. According to a survey conducted by the International Red Cross, over half of the respondents claimed that their homes were damaged and over a third reported being victims of looting. Across Lebanon, one could do little to escape the signs of war. In Beirut, civilians reported that the once beautiful city was now the, quote, noisy, dirty, miserable capital of distress, where instead of functioning infrastructure, there were now, quote, pitted streets and uprooted sidewalks, the damaged buildings, the posh apartment blocks turned into mass havens for thousands. And in the wake of this anarchic state, government policies and ser services were abandoned. And instead, various militias began to shoulder the weight of government functions. Organizations like the PLO, Hezbollah, and the Lebanese forces provided wages, operated food banks, and even collected taxes. Like the political families of the previous decade, many of these militias, some of whom were run by said families, engaged in rentier policies that were coercive and exploitive. These groups often destroyed infrastructure to make populations dependent on them. And individual accounts from journalists highlight many cases of corruption and banditry from even senior officials in these organizations. One reporter described the Asaika faction leader, Zuhair Mosin, as being, quote, an armchair revolutionary known in Beirut as Mr. Carpet because of all the Persian carpets he and his men had stolen. 
Despite these cases of exploitation abuse, sources from this era were often dismissive about the civilian experience. Refugees were often framed as passive actors, pushed by the tides of conflict with little agency or will. In many instances, foreign journalists describe such individuals as being at the whims of the exploitative militias, thereby completely erasing the very real actions many undertook in that period. For example, just after the 1982 Israeli intervention in South Lebanon, the New York Times described the civilians affected as, quote, those who had the bad fortune to live in the path of Israel's invasion. Statements from political leaders in this period were no different. At the United Nations, a diplomat described Lebanese civilians as, quote, helpless. While at the floor of the United Nations General Assembly plenary meeting, Ambassador Boutros Kalan described the turmoil in South Lebanon condescendingly, calling it, quote, an unfortunate district so dear to the Lebanese. Lebanese President Amin Gemayil, at another UN meeting, even blamed the civilian populace at large, claiming that the conflict emerged because, quote, perhaps Lebanon was too democratic, too free, and even lax. Even within the academic sphere, much attention has been placed on the militia economy, with little or few references to the actions of civilians independent of such organizations, thereby devaluing the struggles and experiences of them. Even further complicating this is the fact that the militia control over civilians was often porous and less strictly defined than one might think. The actions of these individuals, therefore, stand in stark contrast to these interpretations. Rather than being passive actors, many civilians engaged in their own work, creating civil society projects and developing social services that were independent of these warring militias. In the 1980s, hundreds of Lebanese civilians worked together to establish organizations like the Campaign for the Kidnapped and Disappeared and the Committee of the Parents of the Kidnapped and Disappeared, which sought to create transparency as to the whereabouts of those unjustly imprisoned. Meanwhile, many civilians joined organizations like the International Red Cross, where they established field hospitals, food banks, and conducted community checkups. Such actions became commonplace throughout the country as government services began to peter out. Other key examples of civilian agency emerged from actions that went beyond the development of civil society organizations. As threats of war and violence were constant figures, basic life necessities and actions became significant problems, often unaddressed by the militias. According to the memoirs of a Lebanese woman named Jean Saeed Bengdisi, she, quote, had to provide domestic services, deal with wrecked homes, create alternative shelters, cope with death. One of the most regular events throughout the Civil War were artillery strikes and bombings, and each incident required immediate proactive action. McDesey described the actions that occurred shortly after barrage struck her area, explaining that, quote, the men go up one by one, carrying fire extinguishers to check on the flats, each family praying that theirs was not hit. Next, they venture out to look at the neighborhood to check on friends and family. In the Palestinian refugee camp of Shatila, one memo revealed that the constant barrage of artillery and sporadic fighting meant that, quote, the men of the camp, many of them skilled workers, carried out the reconstruction themselves. In addition to repairing homes, the two schools, the mosque, and the hospital, they constructed two ground bomb shelters. Others engaged in a wide variety of actors to support their communities during the war. Mayor Rita, a principal organization, organizer of the International Festival Baalbek, explained that during the war, she organized various artistic committees and even developed a neighborhood policing unit to protect the Temple of Jupiter in Baalbek. The famous Lebanese singer Feirouz participated in civilian anti-war protests, while others wrote literature, poems, and short stories to illustrate their own struggles and small triumphs throughout the conflict. A key example is like that of the experiences of a teacher like Raymond Abu, who continued to provide education to students while also taking proactive steps to shield said students from violence. Abu recounted that she had, quote, kept students over for two nights because of fighting between the Lebanese army and a militia. Recognizing that her students faced traumas at home because of the war, Abu and other teachers also attempted to adapt their curriculum, enabling students greater flexibility with their education despite the circumstances. When high school seniors were forced to take a state-mandated exam, Abu took, quote, took all the seniors along with their teachers to the mountains where she had rented a building. The actions of these civilians were attempts at providing normalcy and stability in an era that lacked any. However, these actions were also necessary for survival. Civilians in the Lebanese Civil War were not passive actors. They had, they had to wait on militias or foreign governments. Instead, the actions of individuals like Mayor Rita and John Saeed McDesey demonstrate a proactive resourcefulness needed throughout the 15-year conflict. In fact, the independent nature in which these civilians operated through war and crisis can still be felt today. Lebanese history following the Civil War continued to highlight the agency of individual actors. From events like the Usink movement of 2016, where Lebanese took to the streets to deal with a garbage crisis, to the October 2019 protests, civilians have been anything but passive actors. And in fact, this sentiment is best described in an interview I conducted during the October 2019 protests. 
While discussing the contemporary struggles and political woes, the Lebanese protesters explained to me that, quote, in Lebanon, we find our own solutions. We are entrepreneurs in working things out. Thank you so much, Mr. Tran, for that paper. We're going to transition to the roundtable section now. Uh, so the first question I have would be for all three of you. I noticed that we have three separate fields represented here, history, English, and uh, policy analysis, political science. So in your field, what does war mean and why is it important to study war from below? Well, I, I can give a perspective from the historical field. I think that one thing all three of these papers brought forward, even if they're not necessarily given from the perspective of a historian, is that war does not, is not solely confined to the battlefield and that uh, war often stretches timelines as well. You know, we can talk about the timeframes of war being between the first battle and the last, um, but I think as all three papers talked about, there is an expanded time frame for war as well as uh, a space for war, geographic space for war, and also a, a personal and political space for war as well. So I think from the historical standpoint, one thing that's really important to understand when we're considering war from below is the way in which it illuminates areas that might be overlooked when we study battlefields and when we study uh, military tactics. Uh, we all talked about individuals, we all talked about civilians and the way that they experienced war far beyond uh, the battlefields where they were fought. And I think one unifying trend uh, that I got from all three papers was that uh, war leaves a lasting impression and one that's not always covered in the military textbooks. From uh, a, in, an English perspective or, or a literature perspective, I could say that a war uh, is a conflict which produces literary, emotional responses, blending facts and fiction in imaginative mode. So literature dealing with war emphasizes uh, experiential dimensions. Uh, so the reader looks simply more than facts when she or he is reading uh, literature dealing with war. Um, so aesthetic forms such as historical novels, which were used a lot to describe the experience of war, alters the raw material and highlights the psychological aspect of war. That's why uh, war, war in literature is important. And we study war from cult uh, cultural and literary uh, criticism in literature. Uh, it's important to look at some of the common themes uh, in the book. And it's also important that the literature offers um, more complex discourses of reevaluating social and cultural conflict. And why the um, why the literature why the war globe is important, war from globe is important. It is because uh, we need to deconstruct the canon, uh, such as uh, Hemingway's Farewell to Arms or Stephen Crane's The Red Badge of uh, Courage. They the usually the male writers wrote about war. So by including the works of marginal or underrepresented voices in the study of war uh, provides different, uh, differentiated and unique insights uh, to the concept of uh, war. Yeah, and I, there's a point that Hide just made that I, I really like is the idea of like, you know, her areas like looking at wars from experiences, at least from what I understand in international relations, especially in your undergraduate degrees, war is like the cool thing that everybody wants to study, but it's really something that's a little bit more difficult to define. I think in a lot of ways, just like a casual definition would be something about the long lines of like armed conflict between states or groups. But looking at war from beneath and specifically looking at these experiences is illuminating in different ways. Um, when we look at it from like this high broad level between states or between groups, it's often hard to actually understand the motivations um, that go into war and just some of the reasons why actions of war happen. Uh, so when we take a look at the civilian experiences, we do get a sense, you know, of why these communities may be engaging in war and also just the multitude of ways in which people either support it or don't support it. And it gives this more nuanced um, and, and in international relations, there's like an idea of constructivism where it's not just states, there's other uh, elements at play. And I think our discussion of war from underneath is important to go against that normal war history or international relations idea of war between big countries fighting each other. Thank you so much. As a follow-up, um, I noticed that there were, there were several rationales given for why war from below in terms of like deconstructing the canon or, or changing the picture 
away from thinking strictly about military tactics or battlefields or, or states and instead shifting the focus to individuals. I noticed that the, the kinds of writing that were used as evidence in all three of these papers are marked as private forms of writing. Um, letters, correspondences, diaries, journey, journals, autobiographical writings. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about why these forms of writing are necessary to, to kind of nuance or flesh out or complete the picture of wartime experience. Why private writing when war is often construed as a public activity? So I guess just to keep the order the same, uh, I'll go first. Um, I think one thing that's important to note about war, and, and all of us alluded to it, is that war blends the public and the private. Uh, if we're talking from the historical perspective, a, a lot of scholars have deconstructed the idea of two separate political uh, and private spheres, that public and private weren't as disjointed as perhaps we once imagined them to be. And I think that this is especially true when we talk about wartime. Um, during wartime, uh, people are reflecting not only upon uh, the political events that are driving the war, but also the personal events of their own interaction with the war. Even if they're not someone on the battlefield, uh, they're probably affected by the war in one way, shape, or form. I focused on emotions and talked a lot about the way in which diaries were used to record emotions when thinking about war. And one thing that's important is I talked about, especially about a young woman uh, recording the uh, ramifications of the American Revolution in a diary. I mentioned in my first answer that war should be expanded the time frames when we consider it. Uh, and we're talking about someone who's writing after the American Revolution was over, but the ramifications of that war are still ongoing. And the emotional toll of that war, someone who's forced to flee their home, leave behind their friends and family, and it affected them in uh, every way, shape, and form, from attending funerals to religious services uh, to her very friends and uh, even some family members being on different sides of war. So you can see from the example of Mary Roby's diary the ways in which that public event of war has a very personal private uh, effect and those effects are uh, dialogued uh, by the author in her diary in a way that was both public and private. One thing that's important to note about diaries, we think of the diary today as being an entirely personal event, um, but in the late 18th century, diaries were often let, read aloud and meant to be read aloud. So there's a performative aspect in diary writing uh, where Mary Roby is not only recording her ideas about the war, um, but also demonstrating her uh, sensibility in her writing. Right, to add what Patrick uh, just said, uh, that the diaries or journals individualize this war experiences. And it also, they also bring this feminine aspect or perspective to the war, which is usually associated with this masculine concept. Uh, I also think that they expand the limits of heroic mode. Uh, sometimes they demystify the war and the military and they support pacifism and, uh, and treat war as a phenomenon of destruction and death. Uh, so they deconstruct uh, patriotism and military glory. So that's important. So it, it's very important to uh, think about female voices uh, uh, through diaries or journals and this private um, writing um, and how they contributed to this public uh, voice. Yeah, on a similar line is like the idea of like shared suffering, you know, is, is like that private and public affair thing. It's like a confluence of it. I mean, in my, in my own research, like we focus a lot on civil society organizations like NGOs and other groups. And this is like that confluence. These private individuals whose lives are so drastically affected by war are mm -hmm. undertaking these measures into the public sphere to their own hands. And I mean, using these private sources once again is illuminating because we get the motivations for engaging in war publicly because it's so hard to avoid. The private life is... I mean, oftentimes interrupted by artillery barrages. And so the actions you take immediately after are part of that public sphere and reconstructing your community in a way. So I think, yeah, there isn't a hard divide from what I can see. The private thoughts are illuminating in the public action. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing, going back to what Hidea just mentioned about the distinction between feminine and masculine, this kind of builds on where we've been going with private writing and a focus on the emotions, um, things that... Uh, have historically been attributed to uh, women's writing and, and uh, you know, women's sphere, even though the, the spheres were probably more ideological than, than actual. Um, I'm wondering if you could just give a brief, uh, a brief summary of what gender norms were for your periods, 
since we have three separate time periods and uh, geographic locations, and talk about how this, this influenced the, um, the writing choices that were available to the authors. So jumping in from the earliest um, of the three papers here, in the late 18th century, you have, if you've ever kind of read the American uh, literature on this, you have the emergence of uh, Republican motherhood in uh, the United States. Uh, the idea that um, the proper Republican mother's space was in the home to build a haven for the family, that it should be separate from the kind of dirtier, more dangerous elements of popular politics. Um, one thing that's really interesting, though, I think, in studying loyalist women uh, is that these women were outside of what will become the United States, still within the British Empire, and you actually see them operating a, a little differently. Um, for example, the Roby family's visits to different families blurs that line between public and private really uh, visibly. Importantly, another diarist uh, notes uh, in, in, this is a male diarist in his diary, that his sister, they're a little bit of a more elite rank, uh, his sister doesn't go to visit newly arrived strangers because she supposes they're like all the rest. And while that's often been used to talk about class divisions within the Loyalist Society, I think it actually speaks more to just the prevalence of women in the streets visiting uh, newly arrived families. This was something that was entirely visible for uh, all members of Loyalist Society and probably uh, the non-Loyalist Society too, recognized that women had an important public role visiting families, which is of course a private act in and of itself. So I think Loyalist women, interestingly, are kind of outside of that sphere of Republican motherhood because they're far more public but again, another kind of uh, interesting fact about this family is they'll return to the United States. They'll repatriate in the late 1780s. And upon repatriation, they become far more domestic and are actually quite vocal about it. Uh, and they describe how they enjoy a more private life, raising families or taking long walks in their garden. Um, and so there's kind of an interesting discussion to have there about the ways in which um, this was, again, performance. You know, did these women really enjoy their new private lives or was that more acceptable in the United States where the Republican motherhood ideology was burgeoning and becoming more popular. Just as a quick follow-up, uh, did you find, do you find that the kinds of expectations for loyalist women are different from those who were living in uh, Britain at the time? This is really interesting. Um, Mary Beth Norton has a really good line in her first book, uh, the Loyal focusing on loyalists in Britain, that the American loyalists only realized how American they were once they left. Uh, and this is a really good example of to kind of talk about loyalist women. I think loyalist women had slightly different expectations in exile. Uh, most importantly, a lot of the loyalist women, especially the ones I study who come mostly from New England, uh, fled early on in the war and were from uh, pretty um, high ranking parts of society. And so uh, historians have explained that they were perhaps trying to recreate the grandeur of their pre-revolutionary lives. But I think that's a bit too simplistic. I don't think what's going on is an imaginative aspect. I think it was trying to carve out a niche for themselves in the lands where they landed as exiles. They were different than the people who lived there before, right? They knew, as did others, that they were more American and perhaps dangerous for being tinted by republicanism. And so by practicing these public roles, they were trying to carve out their own uh, society and their own place within that society. Okay, thank you. Uh, so a little, a little later, uh, at the end of the 19th century, we see this reform movements among women, but still women's place was defined within domestic sphere as wives, mothers, or sisters. Uh, so the economic opportunities or job opportunities were very limited to a couple jobs such as teaching or domestic work and usually women of color work as domestic workers for free. We know that it's, it was free labor. But the war blurs uh, the, and disrupt the boundaries of gender expectations and it opened up new opportunities for women uh, who, wanted to, uh, who wanted to go to battlefield as nurses to work in hospitals. It, it was depicted in uh, Louisa May Alcott hospital sketches. So we can see these nurses working for uh, for some of the hospitals during the Civil War. But this accepted belief of women's role shifted, shifted uh, and they had to uh, defend themselves and their properties when the men left uh, to the battlefield. So war temporarily um, gave them the authority to control the, their bodies, their decisions, and their properties. 
So I would say that it opened new opportunities for women. What about the, the kinds of writing that women undertook during the century? One thing that really impressed me about your paper was how the, you made the point that your, your, uh, your diarist, or, or Nancy Emerson, is, is kind of trying to symbolically, or, or perhaps for her it's more than symbol, symbolism, um, but she's trying to affect uh, the outcome of the war through religious rituals. Um, how did writing play into this? Um, they usually use writing as a propaganda. You know, she knew that, as Patrick mentioned that too, they knew that their diary uh, will be uh, read by people from the North or the South. So it's private, uh, so to speak, but it is also public. So they have, they have their audience in their minds. So they are working for that. But I don't think the publishing opportunities for women uh, were um, uh, available at the the time or they needed an editor to do that so uh, yes they were writing but uh, when it comes to publishing there were no opportunities for women as much as men we knew that too how common was it just sorry to keep asking these follow-up questions but how common was it um, for for diarists to imagine uh, future audiences or current audiences reading their diary was this fairly common only a few only in the south it's very common. I can give another example of uh, uh, Kate Drumgold. She's an African-American woman. She was an ex-slave and she wrote her journal diary in 1890, in, uh, at the end of 19th century. So she also addresses her audiences and saying, I'm writing this to inform my no Northern readers to tell them uh, the story of a slave girl and how I made it myself uh, through education and work. So, all of the, like most of these women, uh, uh, most of these women, um, particularly the ones I studied or the ones I read, uh, had an audience in their minds. They knew who are going to read their diaries. So that's why I think uh, we should also focus on what they, we should also focus on what they didn't tell us instead of what they told us in their diaries. So I think it's important to look at their um, literary production uh, from a historical perspective or bringing their life stories or letters uh, because I believe that there are a lot of things that they didn't tell us in their diaries because yeah. of that reason, because they use their audiences. Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. Edwin. Yeah, uh, I guess moving and shifting to the 20th century and to a different continent, mm -hmm. um, the role of women in the Lebanese Civil War is interesting. There's a lot of facets to it, and some of which I'm not comfortable kind of diving into, like cultural nuances and those particulars aren't something that I would feel comfortable explaining, but you see a logistical kind of element emerge that I do find interesting. Um, the memoirs of Jean Said McDesi, who I kind of mentioned in my paper, has an interesting passage halfway through her memoir about how women are kind of the ones that typically go out to the stores who are going out to get supplies and so often like cleaning rubble in the streets because men are usually either, you know, impressed into military service by the militias or targeted by snipers or just are deemed more as a threat. So they're more likely to be, you know, unjustly imprisoned. Mm -hmm. um, and so women end up taking quite a larger amount of space beyond just domestic housework, but in quite literally maintaining stability in society as they kind of like had it in that area. Um, just because men were much more vulnerable at these kind of, years. However, that isn't to say that's the case um, everywhere in the country. It, it becomes difficult because it, it all changes depending on class, maybe religious uh, or, or sectarian identity. Um, socioeconomic class for sure was a huge part in where women could have play a space in the public sphere. Um, and just the nature of conflict also complicates these things. I have really two really interesting examples. Um, mm -hmm. One woman named Sanaa Meh. Uh, Mahadili is pretty well known for being one of the first female suicide bombers. Um, so she ends up being kind of like this transition to non-state actors uh, and female involvement. And another woman named like Suhar Bashara also plays a role in the mil military sphere by being this kind of like assassin. So you have women taking a wide range of roles in this, in this war, just because I think, yeah, there is like a dynamic changing in how women have to interact. In the Civil War. So during the during the um, Lebanese Civil War, you mentioned that there are high-profile women who are acting as combatants. Were there any high-profile men who kind of took a, 
a, a non-traditional or might, maybe not non-traditional, but um, non-intuitive approach to building and sustaining these, these other institutions that you've really called attention to in your paper? I just listened to like an interesting podcast. I can't remember the specific name, but there was like a rocket science organization that was kind of being developed at one of the main universities. Um, mm -hmm. And they were trying to steer clear of the war. Honestly, as far as specific names go, um, I don't have any specific names. I do know from some of the memoirs that I've been reading, um, you do have a lot of cases of men kind of working as like independent doctors. Mm -hmm. um, those who aren't necessarily like trying to fight, they're just trying to be in their communities um, and helping things out. Like in the Palestinian refugee camp of Shatila, there's this like big war in the 80s called the War of the Camps. And I have a memoir of a, of a French medic who goes in and works with a lot of these independent doctors to just save as many refugees as they can, basically. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Maybe at the end of the, at the end of the round table, we could all go around and share some uh, recommended reading for those who are just entering the field. Um, if you really wanted to get oriented to some of these, these questions and themes that we're exploring in the, in the topic in the round table. Um, but moving on really quickly going. So the, Building on the last question that I just asked, um, I noticed that all three papers try to focus specifically on individuals who have an interesting approach to allegiances or an interesting approach to the sides that we generally construe as the, the two sides that are fighting the war. And that there's, we're all, it all seems like we're all trying to complicate uh, a straightforward account of a war as two states uh, who enter into conflict with each other and there are varying degrees of patriotism or commitment among combatants, but these are the general actors in the scenario. And instead, we're all looking at individuals who have a complicated relationship to uh, the side that they're affiliated with. I was wondering if you could talk about, highlight the individuals who you've mentioned in your papers and talk about how they construed allegiance and loyalty. Great. So, um... Hadia, just a quick little note because it connects our two papers. Uh, Mary Roby, who I'll be talking about as an answer to this question, is actually the great aunt of Louisa May Alcott. Uh, her, um, her son, Samuel Edmund Sewell, is her uncle and also the executor of her will uh, later in her life after she becomes wealthy from little women. So there's some connection here about how women in the 19th century uh, perhaps viewed some of their relatives. She probably also possessed this diary I've been talking about at some point. Uh, in her career, or uh, one of her family members did. Um, but to answer the question a little bit more specifically, so Mary Roby, uh, as this diarist, and how we can understand how choosing sides matters. Um, in the late 18th century, women were not allowed to publicly declare their own allegiance. Their allegiances were wrapped up uh, because of coverture laws with either their husbands uh, or their fathers. Mary Roby is uh, younger, she's a teenager, um, she's going to not be able to declare her own allegiance, and she never really makes any public statements in the writings I've read, whether they be her letters or her diaries, about which side she supported during the war. But she does have a really interesting comment on King George III's birthday in 1783, which mind you is only a couple of months after uh, the Treaty of Paris is going to be signed, ending the war of the American Revolution in favor of the Americans. Uh, when she wants to comment on King George III, she talks about how the guns were fired in the streets, uh, cannon were fired to celebrate, the bells were ringing, you know, there's a lot of noise going on in the streets, and she should probably make a comment about the king, but she defers, because as she notes, she's not worthy to. Now, when Hadia talked a little bit about reading what they don't mention, uh, perhaps I'm reading too much into the lines here, but what that reads to me is not a, a statement of kind of humility towards the king, but a statement about, I don't want to express my dissatisfaction with the way the king has operated uh, the war, the way the parliament is now uh, handed over the victory to the Americans and the plight it has caused me and my family. So I think uh, women in the late 18th century, the individual I'm talking about, never makes any clear reference about choosing sides, but she will go on to marry an American, move back to the United States, uh, and raise a son who's a very uh, prominent abolitionist uh, and state senator from Massachusetts. So, uh, you know, these sides and her uh, allegiances are a little blurred, but I think when we read in between, we see where her real allegiances lie. Interesting. So for my case, Emerson, as I mentioned, she's an older woman. She's not a young woman. She's a single woman living with his brother who was a, uh, a, a, was a minister. 
So she's very open about expressing her uh, support for the Confederate cause, and she believes that it's a holy cause. Um, and she's openly against the abolition of slavery. Uh, and there's a quote I wanted to mention about uh, her in her journal. Uh, she says, quote, I am a thousand times better satisfied of the property of slavery than I was before the war, end of quote. So she's, uh, I think it explains everything about her, uh, her um, thoughts about uh, racial segregation or division or the enslavement of African Americans. Uh, so it was a, abolition was a big threat for her uh, because uh, they are scared, like many Southern women, they are scared of losing the privileges, white privileges. Um, that's why she's committed to attending prayers. She wanted to do everything she could do because she can't go to battlefield. That's why she commit, she attends prayers. She uh, writes her journal as an anti-propaganda. Uh, she um, uh, write, write at a, uh, she write her journal as an anti-propaganda. And then uh, she also refuses the testimonies of Union soldiers because she brought other newspapers from the North. Uh, and she physically sends Union soldiers when they came to raid her house. By the way, that happens too. She mentions that. Uh, so she's not a passive observer, but, a, but an active participant. She's very vocal, uh, physically, rhetorically, um, and she writes them in, in her journal. I definitely think that's the same case for a lot of the memoirs I have. It's a lot more of these individuals who are very like public about their actions and also very public in their thought or um, I guess more open in their thoughts. Uh, mm -hmm. So they're definitely more open about discussing things like loyalties. And I think a big facet you get is kind of more so a disillusionment of loyalty, uh, particularly in the later periods of the war where people are just unsure about what they've been fighting for, what the cause of the war even was, what even the motivations behind are. Uh, in a few of my memoirs, you have women that are basically saying, I'm just here to survive at this point, right? I'm just, there's, there's no underlying reason for me to be giving the support that these groups are asking me for. And a lot of the cases you actually have kind of like the ending credits basically say these individuals emigrate out of the country during the war um, that after their years of trying to grasp at these struggles with loyalty, they just leave um, again with survival being the key motivation actually. Yeah, I can definitely, so that seems to make a lot of sense to me that loyalty would decrease over the over the period of the war. But I have a question for Hadia, and then maybe Patrick could jump on this as well. And this has to do with the intensity of loyalty over the course of the American Civil War and the role of emotion in creating kind of a shared a shared community. Since earlier Patrick had mentioned that shared suffering, shared grief is a really powerful centralizing force to bring people together. And as a as a scholar of 19th century literature, I'm well aware of the, the huge outpouring of Civil War memorial poems, um, by, often by Southern women who were kind of grieving and, and mourning the loss of, of husbands and brothers, but also the loss of their, their imagined uh, Confederate Republic that had never come into being. Um, I'm wondering, do you see in the case of Nancy Emerson that uh, you see grief being foregrounded more and more as, as uh, in her later entries as opposed to her earlier entries? And also, um, what might you say about the role of shared suffering to draw boundaries as well as to bring people together? In particular, I'm thinking about the, the racial boundaries among African Americans who experienced the end of the Civil War as a very uh, liberating um, and jubilating uh, thing and not something to be grieved or mourned versus uh, white Southern Americans who often centered grief and tragedy in, in recounting their wartime experiences. So it is interesting that Nancy Emerson, so the, one of the one of the reasons of her grief is the death of the soldiers, right? Uh, so she has some of the incidents in her journal uh, talking about how two of the soldiers died. Uh, so she mentions their mothers and kind of uh, console, uh, uh, comforting her, telling her that the, uh, the sons, they didn't die. They will uh, have the divine grace in heaven. So uh, she finds this religion as a, uh, as a healing method against the grief, uh, for the grief and, uh, and the loss. So she wasn't being really 
upset about it. Even they died, they will resurrect uh, as the victor, as a victor of the war. So mm -hmm. it's interesting how she finds a way to cope with with grief uh, in this way. So she she uses religion uh, in two different ways. One is to justify slavery that the southern cause uh, is the right uh, part in this war, and the second one is her religion gives her comfort and healing um, due to the death. So it's, it's very interesting to see that uh, she, her grief is kind of repressed due to religion. And, and I think in one of the uh, function of her journal is to uh, tell people who lost their husbands or wives or brothers or sons that they shouldn't be sorry because they didn't die for nothing they will be uh, rewarded uh, hereafter. That's her message. And I think to comment uh, quickly on the other part that you're talking about, a little bit about race and grief, um, people often forget that it's perfectly uh, normal to envision the American Revolution as a civil war as well, uh, especially when you're talking about different parts of the American Revolution in the South in particular, uh, the fighting away from the coast was definitely a lot like the Civil War, where you had neighbor against neighbor, town against town. Uh, the same with Massachusetts uh, in 1775, uh, where you had loyalists being uh, run from their homes, including the Roe v. and Sewell families, who I mentioned uh, in this talk. But a little bit about the race and suffering element of this is really important. Uh, one element that uh, a lot of scholars have looked at with uh, the American loyalists are the numbers of um, Black loyalists who fled uh, the um, American states after the revolution, largely because they had sided with Britain, who promised uh, freedom to those who left uh, rebellious masters and fought on the side of the British after Lord Dunmore's proclamation. Uh, and so a lot of these Black loyalists end up in Nova Scotia, and their experience there is uh, far from the one that they were promised. Uh, they're largely... Um, uh, they're totally and completely removed from the white communities. Uh, some of the largest, like that at Birchtown, was just outside of Shelburne, Nova Scotia, one of the largest settlements for the Loyalists. And the two uh, communities had a lot of antagonism towards each other, especially the white community towards the Black community. Uh, the white Loyalists believed that Black Loyalists were willing to work for less, and therefore driving down wages uh, and taking up resources, the already scarce resources meant for white Loyalists. One reason this is important is because even though Mary Roby, who I've talked about, builds this imagined community among fellow sufferers, even if she doesn't know them, even if they come from different classes, from different places. She has an imagined community with fellow sufferers. It doesn't extend uh, to the African-American community of Nova Scotia, and she does have interaction with them. The family will actually come to employ Black servants in their home, and uh, as I can talk about at the end when I recommend the book, uh, that term probably means slave in Nova Scotia, enslaved persons uh, in their home. She also comes across uh, free Africans in living in a park in a hovel made of sod, uh, and she actually envisions how happy they are with their little fire, even though everyone else that she encounters is cold and suffering and miserable. Uh, these people are somehow different because uh, their suffering isn't the same as ours. So suffering can actually also be used to build community, but differentiate as well. And in Loyalist Nova Scotia, there's definitely a differentiation between black and white suffering. Interesting. Ed, Ed, uh, uh, Edwin, do you see that this, this happening as well in the aftermath of the Civil War? suffering being leveraged to draw people together, but also create or reinforce uh, differences? Yeah, I mean, the, the sad reality is for as much as we want to push against kind of um, like sectarian being the only factor, it isn't to say that politicians and other groups did use these sectarian uh, narratives to, again, like further differentiation between different groups. It's such a weird space in the Lebanese Civil War because you do have cases like such as Sabra and Shatila where you know, you've got this sectarian divide of Maronite Christians and Palestinians who you know, they engage in um, what effectively is a massacre of the camps and for a wide variety of motivations, but differences being one of them. At the same time, you do kind of have this case where um, that necessarily isn't the case. I mean, a mall is this like Shia organization that emerges in um, like the early 70s or late 60s um, but they were partnered with Greek Orthodox Christians for a very long time. Um, mm -hmm. And so you, ha and then just the nature of shifting alliances and one faction will align with another until the next day, then they align with someone that you've been fighting for last week. So on one hand, yes, the shared suffering creates these divides to incentivize people to join the militias and to fight each other. At the same time, 
it also is like a unifying factor for a lot of these civilians who are, again, understanding what is the motivation for fighting? What are we fighting for? We're just trying to survive. So there is like a weird, complicated, dualistic nature. And that's just because this is a conflict with 30 plus militias and like 100 different ideologies at play. Yeah, I would imagine that um, it's difficult to talk about a civil war like the Lebanese civil war, where there's not a clear geographic distinction like the American civil war. And this might be why um, centering individual accounts makes a lot more sense than trying to go off of the you know, official uh, account that's promoted by one um, organized conflict participant and because there's no there's no official states that are going to war against each other in a civil war yeah to build on that real quickly there's like an interesting geographic divide that emerges in beirut itself you have a divide between west beirut and east beirut where one side is considered like socioeconomically more prosperous um and it's run by like the maronite faction and so you get kind of this like racial socioeconomic kind of anger that emerges because one side is like seemingly more prosperous and more put together than the other side, which is kind of facing more war uh, and more destruction. So yeah, once again, those informal divides emerge, but it's, it's very hard because of just, there is no simple two states at war with each other. For, for the last question of the round table, um, as historians were often warned against presentism, which is constructing a vision of the past through the political concerns of the present. Um, however, the entire field of history presumes that we study history because we can know something about how to live our lives based on knowing about past successes and failures. Um, so from what you've studied for this panel, um, what's the big takeaway for 2020? What does, what does your research mean in, in this year? So I think the big takeaway from what my research presents is that uh, shared suffering, uh, collective grief is an important uh, centralizing tool and, a, and is often curated by those who are experience, experiencing the worst of the suffering. Uh, and so I think for 2020, it's important to recognize that although there's been tremendous hardship and the tremendous hardship is being uh, kind of put on display through uh, mass media, that the people who are experiencing this hardship or have been for generations, as is the case, um, are important uh, wielders and curators of this new community of grief and that it's a tremendous unifying force uh, to rally and can bring about significant change. Uh, so for my research, uh, I want to mention the uh, ongoing debate about removing the converted monuments and memorials um, because of the belief that they glorify white supremacy. Uh, and we know that they were mostly built in Jim Crow era between 1877 to 1964 uh, to intimidate and isolate African Americans. And uh, the, this comfort, using the comforter image in American institution was also uh, banned uh, in 2020. And I think it's not erasing the history, it's the reinterpretation of history. So uh, Emerson's diary also gives us this chance to face the history and, and uh, kind of face us to ask the question, what are we glorifying about the past? So it's important, I think, to read the history critically to have a better understanding about the past and I think to build a, 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 an equal present and future for everybody. Yeah, just if you don't mind me jumping in here really quick, I see your point about uh, erasing the past by removing Confederate monuments, really connecting to an earlier point you made about the fact that we need to think about what's not said in Emerson's journal, because she's, even as she's recording something that's supposed to be very immediate and private, she's already thinking about how to reach her audiences with a very specific ideological message. So I, exactly. I would definitely see the parallel there. Um, Right, I'm not overreading this. You know, you don't, uh, because it's, uh, we construct narratives, right? We construct visual narratives through monuments. Uh, we construct uh, literary narratives through words. So I think uh, it's important to bring the both sides and it is also tell us that, uh, it's also related to the, uh, I wanted to mention that to uh, changing, the, changing the offensive uh, college mascot's name to respect Native American uh, culture too, right? It's not erasing the history, it's actually respecting it. So I think it's, it's a similar thing for us to maybe read it critically and why they were built and uh, what, how, do, how can we um, uh, yeah, reconstruct it or rebuild the history 
uh, by bringing maybe both voices in a better way. Because the historical fact that's preserved in this case, um, the Confederate monument is itself, uh, the, the historical fact is someone was reinterpreting history that had already happened from a very specific point of view. And so we're, yes. we're trying to recontextualize what that meant. Is, is that about right? Yeah, definitely. Excellent. Sorry, I, I just got excited and had to jump in there. Edwin, what does your research mean for 2020? For mine, I'll go in kind of two points. The, I'll start with the minute one and go with a broader one. For the more minute and more specific one, I mean, uh, it's hard to kind of discuss this without bringing into attention the recent Beirut explosion that happened a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, and my research is basically just kind of like a reminder of how this plays today. When you have 2,750 tons or whatever of ammonia nitrate explode, I mean, the, the, the result reaction is understanding that it's government incompetence that was at play at letting the situation happen in the first place. But what you end up seeing in the aftermath is even more telling is that instead of the government or the army or any kind of major emergency response services kind of help people, most of the people cleaning the rubble, cleaning the streets and helping people get into the hospitals are individual actors and uh, NGOs. And it's just a constant reminder that you know, in the wake of the Civil War, the history has kind of shown this trajectory that once again, it's individuals and civilians shouldering the blame and taking their matters into their own hands. Uh, at the same time, my research kind of wants to assess this from a broader perspective in that we're kind of seeing a changing dynamic and how maybe it's always been this way, but just been unspoken, but this viewpoint of refugees um, in kind of more negative lights, at least across many governments, and my research just wants to highlight that these are people with a ton of agency and a ton of ingenuity that are just trying to survive. And as we have this influx of individuals from Syria and Afghanistan and um, sub-Saharan Africa, it's, it's this trend of dehumanizing them when they are very much human actors, very much with human struggles. So that's just the two points I wanted to address with mine. And just to nuance that second point, um, am I overreading this to hear you saying that just as your research is trying to restore a sense of agency to individu individuals who are experiencing a civil war, even when they're not combatants, they're also trying to emphasize the agency of refugees who are, who are moving from um, really terrible situations, but you're trying not to frame them as passive victims, but as agents who are actively seeking out ways to improve lives for themselves and their families. Yep, precisely. That's, that's exactly what I'm kind of just trying to highlight is, again, that these are individuals taking real actions into their own hands. And mm -hmm. we shouldn't be judging individuals as just, you know, needing help um, from like some, some savior or anything along those lines, but recognizing that they're doing what they can to make, a, make the best out of a situation. And it's definitely something very important to respect. Well, thank you all for sharing your, your, your training, your wisdom, your knowledge with us, for being generous with your time. I know that I've learned a lot about uh, the concept of war in general, but you've also challenged my conceptions about war as a public uh, activity. And uh, I'm really interested in this concept of shared suffering. So, um, Dr. O'Brien, what would be a, a book that I could read if I wanted to know more about this? I'll open, the up, um, I'll open this up for closing remarks. And if you have a couple of uh, suggestions for reading, uh, please go ahead and share your, your top recommendations. Great, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be a part of this. Uh, thanks to everyone at Ask Historians and everyone for putting this together. It's really been a pleasure to be a part of such a public facing uh, uh, conference and opportunity. I learned so much from all three of the papers and just from being a part of this. Uh, just some quick books, if you're interested in reading, you probably want to start with Maya Jasanoff's Liberty's Exiles. Uh, maybe go back to Mary Beth, Mary Beth Norton's The British Americans, Casey Tillman's Stripped in Script, uh, is great on Loyalist Women, Rebecca Brannon's From Revolution to Reunion about the return and reunification of Loyalists, and Harvey Amani Whitfield's North to Bondage to talk a bit about um, Black Loyalists. I want to say a special thanks to everyone at the Massachusetts Historical Society and Nova Scotia uh, Historical um, Archives for putting, helping me with all the work with this, and uh, it was a pleasure to be a part of it. Uh, so I want to thank uh, everyone uh, and the organizers and the panel 
panelists for this great discussion. Uh, there are a, a few readings I could suggest. Uh, one of them is Nancy Emerson's journal, of course, and another one if you wanted to read another journal from a, uh, a, an ex-slave's perspective, Kate Drumgold's A Slave Girl Story would be a great read. Uh, it's a little bit challenging because it's nonlinear, uh, and it could be hard to um, connect the dots in her journal, but it's also important uh, to read uh, the war from a, 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 an ex-slave's ex uh, female a domestic worker and as well as a teacher later in her life. Uh, and another reading I could suggest is uh, Drew Faust, Mothers of Invention, Women of the Slave Holding South in the American Civil War. Uh, that's one of the books. And if you're interested in reading, again, journals or autobiographies, I could uh, suggest two uh, criticism about autobiography theories, Philip Lejeune on Diary, and another one is uh, Sidona Smith uh, and Julia Watson's reading autobiography, A Guide for Interpreting Life, Interpre Interpreting Life Narratives. Uh, and I want to thank again for the organizers and the panelists. Yeah, I would also like to echo the same sentiments as everybody. Thank you so much, Ask Historians, for organizing this amazing panel. I definitely learned a lot. Um, uh, despite being an American, my American history is not the best. So this was a very illuminating subject. So thank you, everybody. Uh, as far as books, I would recommend, I have three primary sources that I would start off with. The first is Surviving the Siege of Beirut um, by Jean Said McDesey. Uh, the second one would be Women of Lebanon, which is an, or a collection of different um, interviews with Lebanese women and their experiences during the Civil War. Um, and it is organized by Nadim Latif. That's another one. And the last one I really enjoyed, which is kind of a little rare one. I actually only just found this at a random used bookstore and I couldn't find anywhere else, but it's called Besieged, a doctor's story of life and death in Beirut. And it's about this French doctor that I mentioned who goes to the Palestinian refugee camp of Shatila to basically be their main doctor. Um, and it's an incredible story. And so I definitely recommend that one. As far as secondary sources go, I think my number one go-to would be Milani Kemet's um, Compassionate Communalism, um, Welfare and Sectarianism in Lebanon. It's a very in-depth political analysis of the socioeconomic um, economy or socioeconomic status of Lebanon during the Civil War and even up to the future. It analyzes the militia economy I've kind of referenced about how it leads today to the current political parties and their kind of coercive measures. Um, and a final secondary source I recommend is Augustus Norton's a Short History of Hezbollah. So it's tangentially related to the Lebanese Civil War. It focuses specifically on the Hezbollah organization, but it's a great source at just seeing how the Civil War created some of these militias and the motivations that resulted in their formation. So I really found it and it's a really easy read as well. Like that's the big thing. So yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, everyone. So we've come to the end of our time. And I just wanted to give one last thank you to Ask Historians and everyone who's worked so hard um, to make this conference a reality. I know that this has been in the works for a long time. And I just wanted to uh, thank our producers, uh, the, the organizers at Ask Historians and everyone who has generously donated their time time and expertise to bring high quality answers about history to, to the public. Thank you.